space at each angle between the magnetic field and the um, circular motion, or it's not a circular motion, between the electron velocity. So, again, by a very simple geometry, right, just that equation, A equals to ds d theta. And so we have A already. A equals to what? Omega G sine alpha. And because D theta is approximately, so we get we add a slash here. The approximately two over gamma. So the well this is the scale of the arc length. period of time that you will see the electron emitting. And so this because it's up length and because we assume that, that the velocity is but the, the velocity changed because it, it is in a helical motion, but the speed should be unchanged because it, the, the speed is so high comparing to the energy it emits. So it is just distance equal to speed And so we get this T2 minus T1 equals to 2 over omega T gamma psi alpha. Yep. But this is not what we want because we want to, because we, we, we are observing, right? We are only observing from during this duration. But T1, T2 minus T1 is the moment that the electron emits the light, right? But we are here in a very, at a very far distance. So there would be time difference for the photon get, which is get emitted from position number one. When, when it's emitted, photon travels this way. And the electron is approximately also travels approximately the same direction on average. But because the electron travels in not the speed of, time, uh, of light, so they, there will be time difference for the for the delta T of photon emission and the delta T of um, photon arrival, right? Arriving to our telescope. Right? So there will be different those terms and well so what we are interested in is actually t2 minus t1 but the arrival times and the arrival time well would be would be uh, shorter than t2 minus t1 by a factor of this this is well I, I want to say this is simple geometry but this is not so simple, you, you cannot really calculate this in your mind, so you have to draw it. But if you, you, can, you, can, you can try, just assume this is, well, this is very far, this is D, right? And so the photon get emitted from position one, it travels to position two in the time of delta S over C, right? And, but at the same time, when the photons get emitted, the electron also travels. The time for the electron to travel from here to here is what is um, delta S over V, right? And, and when the electron gets here, it emits the second photon, right? But then the first photon should be some, somewhere here, right? So the, this time difference is shorter than this, this time difference. And this, um, this moment, should be no. So for the photon get emitted from uh, position number two to arrive to the to the um, detector on Earth, should um, it take the time of d over c, right? So 
So if you add them up and compare the electron travel time and the speed uh, and, the, and the light travel time distribution here using these three um, things, you can see that T2 arrival or minus T1 arrival should equals to this T2 minus T1 times 1 over and V over C. Yeah, because there is a difference between um, those two of this factor. It is not, it is not so obvious. Yeah, so you have to really draw it and, and mark all the time, all the moment of time. And then you will see that if you, if, if you relate um, the arrival times and the emission times, it is related by this formula. And interestingly, this looks familiar, right? This is one minus beta, which is what? Which is gamma to the minus two, right? So the arrival time difference of the two photons should be just two over omega t. And this is their factor of two gamma, one gamma, so it's gamma two. And then sine alpha. Yep. And for well, if you if I'm writing the the textbook, I will just leave this two here. But if you look at the textbook, they all only two. So I have to follow. Why this has omega g gamma q psi r. You can add back to two, but it, you, you will find that it doesn't really matter to the power minus one. Yeah, so it's just omega two. Uh, sorry, did you say that the one minus v over c was equal to gamma to the power minus three? Or yeah. that, that times that and gamma? No, oh, it's equal to this. Yeah, here. Yes, this one equals to this one. Yeah. Because gamma.
define this thing. Yeah, and this thing will be actually plugged in into the into that function. Good. And or if you if you like if you like linear, if you don't like angular, then you can also define VC is equal to three over four pi. It's just the same. Or maybe G sign R. The important thing is you you have all the dependency of the geometry here and the um, the duration angular frequency, the lambda frequency is here. So these are uh, this include all the basic physics in this uh, characteristic frequency. And so this this equation. And I will just write the next equation because it is very tedious to derive. It takes a whole chapter to derive. So I will just write it. It is the so if you calculate from the first principle the power per solid angle received by any relativistic um, Beaming effect, then it will be this very long equation. But we actually we, we are not um, so interested in the equation itself. We are interested in the in the graph. If you plot this, if you plot this equation, you will see an interesting thing. So I have already skipped a whole chapter of textbook. You don't need to worry. You don't understand it. There's some basic feature I will explain. This one. So all the variables are defined by what we have discussed. And this fine is the polar angle. So this is it uh it is integrated over the whole sky. So you have theta and and and, and phi. But you can you you don't need to worry about it. Important thing is you you see the power per solid angle is only dependent on this theta, gamma times, times theta. Right? The theta dependency, which is actually the time dependency, get absorbed in this theta only. Right? This whole formula. So here it is time dependent in the in in this thing. You may ask why it is it is theta um, gamma times theta, not gamma, not theta itself. You know why? Because we are talking about the arrival time, and the arrival time depends on these two points. These two points depends on how fast is the energy. I see the electron traveling. So gamma is actually implicit function of t. Right? So, but all the function of t depends on this, this factor. Good. And if you draw it, it should maybe look familiar to you. If you have read some papers about the, uh, uh, the radio astronomy, you will notice this. This is the beam. This is what the radio astronomer is called the beam. And what is this? Yes, one over gamma. This is what we just defined. If you plot this, it is this this graph. Yep. And yep. So just by very simple geometry. I'm sorry to say this again and again. Radius time angle equals to R length, and we have the arrival time. We just calculate it. It is this, right? Because this is ah, that thing. Right? We just talk about one time. You you can think about it as, as t two minus t one, but t one is zero, right? So for for a particular time, moment of time, should be related by this equation, and so this thing would be 
gamma q omega g t arrival psi alpha. Yep. Yes. So you just um, multiply these. You just divide these by this. You get this formula. Yep. And this is proportional to what we just defined. You still can you still can observe why we have to add the three um, the, the the two for that, but just it is the way it is. It is the most simplest definition in the integration you will encounter in a moment. So yeah, now the electric field we should expect the electric field we observe on Earth this. This photon, the electric field should be of this form. It, it, it should be an exponential i omega t, right? And now we have to do the Fourier transform again because we want to know not the time dependent, but we want to know the spectrum, right? So the electric field is this times the normalization, right? And then so it is some function, function of time, right? Because it's amplitude, right? This is now what what astronomers do all their approximations and and get their help by compu um, computation. Because we from this point we don't need to do any analytical <coughs> solution again. If you're doing research, you just plug this plug those equations into the computer. Because we know that we don't we, we don't care about the absolute um, amplitude of the electric field. We know that it must be a function of time, right? And this function of time, the time is only dependent on this, this expression, so it's gamma theta. And then because gamma theta is proportional to omega t, right? So omega c t arrival, just to be explicit, you can remove the a here. So, yep, and I'll uh, minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity, and so you get this. So just by changing variable, you multiply one omega c here, right? So there should be a omega c, and then so you can change the variable into a dummy variable because this is t. Multiply by omega c, are divided by omega c first, yeah. And so, uh, and then exponential i omega um, the sign. Oh no, this is this is what? How to pronounce it? Is it Cassie? Mega C. C. Anyway, I like this because I think this is cool. Okay. I can just use. We define the C as um, omega t, omega c multiplied by t. And yeah, and if you take the absolute of this electric field and square, this is what I'm talking about when we talk about the magnetic field density, uh, magnetic energy density, right? This would be the power, right? So the power. So how do we 
we want to know the, the constant C. And so we just integrate P omega over omega.
when we have gamma ray instrument, we are not, you cannot focus gamma ray unless you have an extremely long telescope, right? Because you, you know the, the space, X ray space telescope usually uh, its length is about a few meters. So if you have to build a gamma ray telescope, if you want the image of gamma ray, then the length of the telescope might be longer than the rocket is sending to space. So it is not it's, it's not convenient, right? So what we did, what we um, when you heard about okay, there is a gamma ray telescope. It is actually not a telescope. It is just a detector. I should not say it's just, but it is that detector. It's a sensitivity detector, which when the photon, uh, when the gamma ray photon hit the detector, it registers the photon. It registers the photon energy and the, photon, and the numbers of photons in different energies. So that is the what we call the flux, the observed spectrum. And then you have to convert that to the um, to the real physics because in the in the in the detector we are just counting. We're just counting. How you may ask how do we know the energy of the electron? Because the we know the response of the detector. So we know that we can guess, okay, this photon should be of this energy range, because that energy, that channel of the energy range registers that photon. Right? So we have huge uncertainty in gamma ray astronomy. Right? And what, what we observe is the F mu, which is this, this thing. And so well, actually this is almost over. And yep, yep. So here, when you're taking a break, um, yeah, I replace the x here by new over mu e. What is new? New is the um, frequency of the photon you detect, gamma ray photon. And mu e is proportional to um, omega c. So then, how do you get it? Because we just define mu e equals to two, no, uh, omega c over two pi, yeah, this thing. And then, yeah, and then you will see why, why, um, oh, I uh, ripped it up. The, I told you that the spectrum peak is um, proportional to the energy squared multiplied by the magnetic field strength, right? And you will see here, right? Because nu e equals to omega c over 2 pi equals to 1 over 2 pi times blah 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 those questions. Yeah, just copying um, somewhere omega c. Yep. And you get the gamma squared term here, right? And actually, gamma squared is just E over the rest mass, the rest energy of the electron, right? So you get the you get the energy here. Now the E is not the electric field, E is energy here. Okay? And then you get this spectrum, right? This is omega G. Right? So you get this term. And that's what I told you that the spectrum of a single bond. There are two features. First one is this peak. This peak is approximately mu e, which is proportional to v squared over b. So everything is approximation. But um, but yeah, we can use the peak to estimate the magnetic strength. Yeah. So approximate. Well, it's because usually we we plot the the spectrum in the log scale, right? So the absolute value doesn't really matter, right? Because everything will be, will have an error of about 10, right? Because it's not scale. So, but we can estimate the um, magnitude of magnetic field of the, of the emitting stellar object. So this is good. And yeah, this, why we, did, why we um, define new E as omega C over 2 pi is if you think back what is omega C, oh it is dependent on the gyration frequency 
right? And the transmission frequency is the frequency that the electron emit most of its energy, right? Because well, this is just the relativistic version of cyclotron um, radiation, right? And if you think back about the physics of cyclotron radiation, is why do you have a variation of energy, um, EM field? It's because the electron is doing a circular motion or helical motion, right? And so the magnetic field as observed by an observer changes. How it changes depends on the circular motion. So the frequency depends on the on how fast the electron is gyrating around the magnetic field. Right? So this omega C should be somewhere around the peak of the um, synchrotron spectrum. So this is the whole logic. And you, because you may ask why this is this peak is nu e, because this peak is should be somewhere around omega c, right? So this this is the logic, and yeah, and I I told you that the second feature is the slope, right? If I plot f nu, the alpha would be one third, and why? It's because you can try to compute this. This function, and when x is small, f x approximately depends on x to the power of one third. When x is small, when x is much less than one, much less than one. Yeah. Yeah. So this explains the feature of this um, synchrotron. Uh, of the synchrotron um, spectrum, and yeah, close of time. So I cut it off. Yeah, and but in the outer space, we don't only have one electron, right? So we try to imagine different types of electron distribution. The first simplest type would be the Maxwellian distribution. Maxwellian distribution happens when the particles are in thermal equilibrium, right? So Maxwellian distribution is is of the form of a yep, n e function of gamma. Gamma square over or oh no, gamma over gamma th. I will say what gamma th an exponential minus gamma over gamma th. Gamma th is the characteristic frequency uh, energy of the electron in the Maxwellian distribution. So uh, it is actually kt right in the Maxwellian distribution. So if kt is so you can write kt. Um, in terms of the average energy of electron, right? So you, I, I'm, yeah, I'm just writing kT as gamma th for convenience. Okay, so it's nothing, it's nothing mysterious. You can think about, you can think of kT equals to the gamma th. Ratio between the um, average uh, electron energy. Um, no, this is just a rest mass energy. So it's just the, F, uh, the ratio between the temperature and the energy um, rest mass energy of the electron. So it's nothing mysterious, right? So uh, so if you integrate it, I don't want to repeat the math. So you can try to do it. I will scan this natural to the to canvas so you can take a look. But the, the, the trick is to assume is to well we do the transformation of variable because we know that gamma E proportional to omega C, this is the definition. And omega C proportional to gamma squared. Right, we have the omega C all. Yeah, here. Gamma squared. Here. Yeah. 
So we know that gamma e proportional to well, no, sorry, mu e proportional to gamma square. Yeah. So we can make the change of variable to frequency equal to some dumb new variable multiplied by omega ah uh, sorry mu e which is proportional square some some characteristic um Lorentz pattern right I just explained here yeah so this is proportional to this so we can make use of this change in variable we, you, you can try try to do it yourself at home so we what we do is just plug in this formula or plug in this part back to here and then the result would be oh this thing gamma th multiplied by the double variable power two through and then integrate from one over gamma t to infinity x minus five over two exponential and then minus half variable again square root x to the power minus one half and then this very important synchrotron kernel and yeah you can forget about this because when you calculate this is just the the how the normalization of the of the spectrum right this is how you define your y axis doesn't matter right we we, we will know this if we know the distance from the source right but most of the time we don't know the distance from the source in astronomy so this is just a normalization you can you can set it arbitrarily and the shape if you plot this shape it is oh, this thing. and this will be a little bit wider than this shape this shape is emitted from one single electron this shape is emitted from a, well, a, a, a bunch of electrons which are in thermal equilibrium okay and also here it must be one third because if you think about if you, if you think the integration as summation actually what you what you're doing here after all the tedious math is just you stack the single electron version many times here right so the slope should be unchanged right the low energy slope must be the um, um, one over three and here it would be If you if you are plotting in this number variable, which is which is uh yep, which is equal to mu over mu e, then it is approximately equal to one. So this is yet another. This you can you can you can verify what I've told you that the peak of the spectrum happens around um, omega c or around mu e, right? Because when you plot this function. Um, f mu as a function of um, the c, which is mu over mu e, you found this approximately equal to one. The x, the x coordinate, approximately equal to one. So that means this is mu e, right? Yep. So this is Maxwellian distribution, and another, another, another very important distribution is the. Uh, the power law distribution. So well in in natural science we encounter a lot of power laws. Right? The for example the radioactive pellet uh, isotope when it decay radioactively we have a power law and the, well it is difficult to to explain from the first principle why um, why the so 
one astrophysical phenomenon would be in the form of a power law. But this is what we observe. So we can say this is a rule of thumb to assume this is a power law from empirical evidence. So we just try. You can try other shapes, right? You can try weird shapes of ND. It's, it's okay. But Mathelian and power law are the most frequently used um, electron distribution. So it just the electron energy is proportional to oh, sorry, the electron density is proportional to um, the electron energy to the power of some minus index. And actually I don't want to I just want to draw the graph here. So this one and E gamma, if you visualize it, it's a power law, right? So if you integrate this area, this is the total number of electrons in your interstellar car. Okay? And this should be basically the minimum energy of the electron. So we usually call this the injection energy. So if you read um, papers and you see all these terms that they explain in nowhere. So now I, I hope you can remember at least this. If you look at if if you if you see the keyword injection energy, it usually means that okay we are doing some integration and we don't know what is the lower limit. So we assume there is a lower limit of particle energy, which is called the injection en energy, which the the, the, the the energy of electrons get injected, but well, that energy get the lowest energy of electrons into get injected into the population by some other physical processes. We might or might not know yet. In this case, if, if we are talking about gamma rivers, we don't know. We don't know how evidence no. So we have no absolutely no idea what causes that um, the, the lower cut, cut off of this um, power law. But we assume there is a lower, 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 um, lower cut off because you blow up, right? So you must cut off somewhere. And yeah, and the synchrotron um, frequency, oh sorry, and the synchrotron spectrum, you just, it's very simple. You just plug in gamma to the minus P. P is some index, we call it just slope. Here into that equation, and you get this, which you cannot. You can only um, draw it computationally because it is you can't solve it mathematically. But you can get some insight. So and f u over u e d. It's after changing variables, you change the integral, and then you get something like this. And yeah, you see the new the, the photon energy is actually also um, a power law. So if you inject a power law distribution of electrons um, into a synchrotron kernel, so if you if you have a power law distribution of electrons. And if it, those electrons emit synchrotron radiation, then the spectrum should also be a power law. See? Right? Because you're just integrating something. This is pure number. Right? This just modifies the shape a little bit, but the slope should be just the same. And then and then you encounter two well people call this synchrotron fast cooling. I will explain this term and, and then we are done. Yeah. So you don't have, you don't need to do any calculation for this one anymore because you just I'm just trying to explain to you some this is because this is actually the bit that connects to um, to active research. Right. So fast cooling spectrum will be three segments of power laws. The lower segment must be 
convert by power one volt because we put it, this is power one volt. So the lower segment is this, and the middle segment is something. Um, the, the power it does is something else, and then the higher segment depends on P, whatever. And there is another spectrum called the slow cooling. And you may wonder why they are fast and slow cooling. So I will first write it. One third and new to the power of my minus P minus one over two and U to the minus P over two. So you see, they only differ in the middle segment, right? The low energy and the high energy segment are the same for these two spectrum. And I didn't write it, I didn't write explicitly the, the condition. So the fast cooling is when new smaller than a value called the cooling frequency and the middle segment is when the frequency is in between the cooling frequency and the minimum frequency and the higher segment is when the new is larger than minimum frequency this is strange because, of I, I, because the minimum frequency is larger than the cooling frequency and this is actually why it's called fast cooling so when I'm ready to understand so in the slow, slow cooling case, everything changes. So you just walk cool and mean. So the lower seven is new is smaller than new mean, middle seven, new mean, smaller than new, smaller than new cool, and uh, higher seven is new larger than new cool. And this is very important because the power law synchrotron is much wider than these two cases and you have three segments the cooling frequency is connected to the maximum point here it's connected to here and the minimum frequency is connected to the injection frequency here so it's somehow connected I can so I will explain to you graphically there is a when you if in the future if you do if you do um, computer simulation for your research project then you may have to solve the um, hydrodynamic equation right and in those equations you have energy of electrons or particles or whatever particle energy is this right so Dog, the rate of change of energy is proportional to gamma dot, right? And then the and then you you will need one very um, important equation for your computer simulation, which is this. This is the density of the matter and gamma, whatever. But the important you will get this important fact factor. And so you see you if gamma is higher, right, because these both are negative, so if gamma is higher, the range of change or the energy is higher. That means these distribution of electrons, they are not fair. The more money you get, the faster you lose the money. Right? So when time goes on, this Electron distribution will change, right? Because the electron lose energy when it radiates. So it will shift to lower energy, but it cannot keep the shape. And so the shape of the electron distribution will be like this. The higher the energy, the faster it loses energy. So here in, in the low in the high energy part, is it becomes a, a curve. So this is no longer a power law. This is the curve. And if you stack many, many um, energy um, distributions, so because when, when we observe a stellar object, we do not just observe um, for one time moment, for one moment, right? We 
um, the radiation he received is actually radiated by uh, by the source at different moment because the source is actually not one source, right? It is so far away, it looks like one source, but in the in the emitting region. So for example, if you have a jet, you have a jet, right? And you have synchrotron radiation all in the jet, right? And actually, the photons emitted from this one would arrive later than the than the photon emitted from this point, right? So what you observe is a stack of many multiple um, um, uh, electron distribution. So when you add them up, so you will get something like this. And this is the so-called cooling frequency. You cool. This is cooling frequency. And because the synchrotron spectrum, yeah, the synchrotron spectrum would be um, composed by many, many um, single, many, many groups of the, uh, how to say? It would be composed by many different moments. This, uh, the, the spectrum emitted from different moments from the source because you look at different moments of the source at the same time, right? So you, when you when you look when the photon from this point travels, it uh, arrives at the detector. You should also see the photon emitted from here because there will be time different time delay because the, the length of these two lines are different, right? So it is a stack of multiple emission. Um, spectrum of this um, power law. So if you calculate that, you can explain this this um, slow and fast cooling scenario because the spectrum will be very, very broad, will be like this. This is the cooling frequency, and this is the minimum frequency. And actually, this is one spectrum, but you don't have only one spectrum. You have many more spectrum because what you are doing in integration is just this so you have many many different spectrums all stacked together from different groups of electrons so you create this four spectrum and this is slow cooling case, this slope would be minus p minus 1 over 2, and this would be minus p over 2. Yeah. In this case, the minimum frequency is, is lower than the new um, cooling frequency. So the, and you can actually have the, these two frequencies all the reverse. And those, those is called uh, the fast cooling, that is called the fast cooling case. That means um, if you have a black hole, central black hole, it ejects energy into the electron distribution. And when it ejects the energy, when it, it ejects the energy, in, energy into the electron, then all the electrons instantaneously, like not instantaneously, but um, emit the energy via synchrotron radiation in a very fast time scale. So it's like when you give them money, they spend it. They, 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 they spend instantly, right? When, when, when the black hole gives the electron money, the electron spend it. So it's called fast cooling, fast spending energy. So the, the cooling frequency will be lower than the minimum frequency. So if you stack this in the reverse order, you will get the, um, the, 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 this slope of a different value, which is minus one, one half. And this value, um, this spectrum, you can only obtain from a semi-analytical um, treatment. If you if you look at the textbook I I I've listed in the in the worksheet, yeah, they have 
semi and medical treatment, you have to do a lot of approximation at different frequency range to, to obtain these this indexes. Or, more simply, you just plug this, uh, plug this equation into the computer and it gives you this. You just have to specify what is the cooling frequency and the minimum frequency. And it gives you readily these two shapes. So you can try. So this is synchrotron radiation and the, the um, I asked you something in the in the worksheet if you're interested you can you can look at the the middle box. I asked you where do you usually find synchrotron radiation? The picture is the GRV, the gamma reverse, and in gamma reverse people are debating for I think for thirty years or more if the radiation they receive are from slow cooling or fast cooling is still happening. The debate. So you can if you go to some um, international conference, you will often see um, observers and theorists they debate about what is fast cooling. And usually we will just hear some funny funny conversation like, Yeah yeah, but I don't understand that. Why why would that be so? Because it's slow cooling. No, it's fast cooling. And the whole conversation, like for half an hour ago, was just meaningless because they are talking about different things. Because they are, it, 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 the, the research of um, gamma rivers um, has evolved to a point that we, we, need, we need money, we need more new um, telescopes to unveil the true nature of gamma rivers. Now we are only using the old data. And by the, from the old data, we cannot distinguish between the scenario. We don't even know if it is a single or not. Yeah. So this is the state of the art. This is actually the state of the art of um, high energy astrophysics. This part, the single chunk radiation of the power of distribution of the electron. Yeah. So, um, I hope this <coughs> lecture is somehow useful, although it is boring. And I would, yeah, I will give you these natural looks um, on, on campus. And I, I don't know when when should you hand in the homework? Because I, I made a mistake. I I, I thought Josephine will give you another problem set for the compound scattering. But actually the I, the, the problem set three I gave you last um, two weeks ago for the bronze one. I, I told you num problem number three to number seven are bronze one. And I told you just ignore number one and two, but it's not the case. One and two is Josephine's. They are Josephine's. Um, um, they are present set, so you should do it. But I, I, I think she said you can have a few more days to do it. Yeah, yeah. Then, then I extend. So I'm sorry about that, but um, yeah, I hope you would enjoy the these different kinds of radiation processes because these are really fun and this is actually the one of the few things that you need to know if you want to do research in, in high energy physics. Yeah. So